Um, this is Katie Chase. We're very happy to have Lena Wendland joining us today. Um, for those of you who don't know her, Lena has been an advisor on business human rights in the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights since 2004. She has been part of the team, special, former special representative of the Secretary General on Business and Human Rights, Professor John Ruggie, during his mandate from 2005 through 2011. And as part of her role then, she contributed to the development and drafting of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. She has led OHCHR's involvement with the UN Global Compact since 2002. And more recently, she headed the Secretariat of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights and of the Annual Forum on Business and Human Rights until January 2014. Currently, she's leading OHCHR's efforts to support implementation of the UN guiding principles at the country level and through strategic embedding in relevant global governance frameworks. She also leads OHCHR's Corporate Accountability and Remedy Project, which is uh, the project she'll be discussing with us today. And this project aims to enhance accountability and access to remedy in cases of business involvement in serious human rights abuses. Before she joined, HR, Lena was consulting on human rights issues to a range of international NGOs and intergovernmental organizations. And from 1993 until 1997, she headed the Media Law Project at the Center for Applied Legal Studies at the University of the Witwatersrand. She holds a master's degree in law from the University of Copenhagen. Very impressive background. We're so happy that you're able to join us today. Just to really quickly um, announce sort of our plan for the call, I'm going to hand things over to Lena. She'll walk us through um, a presentation she's put together on the OHCHR's Accountability and Remedy Project. So at this point, I will um, hand things over to Lena. Thanks. Unmuted. Thank you very much, um, Katie, and thanks for this very comprehensive uh, introduction. Um, I should also mention that on the call is my colleague Ranghil Handegard, um, who is our lead project manager for the OHCHR Accountability and Remedy Project. And Ranghil will also be saying a few words um, at the end and, and be very well placed also to help answer any questions, particularly as it relates to the global online consultation that we are currently running for the project. Um, so I'll ask after I've gone through the presentation that I've prepared, I'll ask Ranghil to to just say a few words about the about the global online consultation, and then we'll hand it over for questions. Um, I don't think I can manage the slides from here, so if you wouldn't mind, yeah. Um, so we OHR we initiated the project um, to enhance corporate accountability and access to remedy for victims actually all the way back in May 2013 when we um, initiated a study by an expert, Dr. Jennifer Zirk, to look into what are the key barriers in access to remedy, but not just looking into barriers, also trying to say what, in order to overcome that, those barriers, what kind of issues should we be focusing our attention on? Many of you will have, um, like, like me, spent the past uh, 10 plus years looking into barriers, and we really wanted to reach the point where we would focus not just on, on the barriers themselves, but really make a concerted effort um, to, to develop solutions. Um, uh, and that the approach we took would, would, uh, was that we wanted to be evidence-based in the approach that we were taking. We would develop the project through inclusive transparency. We also aimed um, from the outset that whatever we would, um, wherever we would be ending up, it would be uh, practical action-oriented guidance um, that would be suitable for a range of legal systems and traditions. Now, why did we um, start this project? Um, it was really to try to dig deeper into the third pillar of the UN guiding principles that you all know is the access to remedy pillar. I recently heard that pillar described as the orphan of the guiding principles because there is a sense that more attention has been um, paid to the duties of state under pillar one and the responsibilities of companies under pillar, through, pillar two, whereas um, there is the sense that, that that the real some of the real challenges remain with respect to um, and pillar three 
in the guiding principles. The principles there are they cover obviously a, a broad range of, of issues, but they are they they restate the fundamental principle that state must provide access to effective remedy. And then the first few principles under that pillar goes into identifying some of the barriers um, that that we identified in the process of developing uh, pillar three. But it sort of stops short on saying um, how those barriers can be overcome. It does say that states must take effective measures to overcome the barriers. When it comes to what actually that implies, what are the kind of efforts that would be most effective? Um, the, the guiding principles are a little bit um, uh, thin on that sort of more deep, uh, deeply rooted guidance. So we thought this was um, an identified need. This was stakeholders, both from civil society, obviously, but also from, from business and from states were saying that they're battling with pillar three. And so we thought this would be, then it would be a pro take up. And so, as I said, we started, if you can move on to the next uh, slide. So we started, as I mentioned, with the commissioning of the study in 2013. We published the initial study um, uh, back in 2014 in February. It's a very comprehensive study. Uh, those of you who've had a chance to look at it, um, that really is looking at both comparative um, information from, from, I think it's about 11 jurisdictions, and also looking at some 40 um, cases to try to really tease out where, what are the issues in, in, in different legal systems and different national jurisdictions? And the cases that do go to court, why, why do they end up where they end up? What are the kind of issues that seem to, um, to, to determine whether or not um, a, a judicial remedy is, um, is possible and whether indeed it is an effective? So um, the study by Jennifer Zerk contained a number of recommendations as to how to move to that next level of actually identifying uh, solutions. And we, um, at the launch of the study in February last year, we then called on uh, stakeholders to provide us with um, submissions and comments on the recommendations, on the study and on the recommendations, on the basis that we wanted to try to identify which would be the priority issues that we would focus on. The study being very comprehensive had identified a, a vast of issues that were all quite different in nature. Some of them were very strictly sort of technical legal. Some of them were, were practical. Uh, some of them had to do with, with funding, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we thought, well, we can't really launch a process or have a meaning for this that aims to resolve all of these issues at once. So let's try through a consultative process to identify which should be the priority ones, either because they would be the most urgent ones to resolve, um, or because they would be issues that where it would seem that actually one could make relatively. So we, um, we had the consultation process running until June 2014. And in fact, that process coincided with the discussions at the Human Rights Council that I'm sure you all um, which was both the renewal of the traditional, let me call it that, business and human rights resolution of the Human Rights Council, the one that um, mandates the working group on, on business and human rights and the annual forum on business and human rights and, and various other things. And then, of course, there was the negotiation of a solution to create an intergovernmental working group to develop a legally binding instrument on business and human rights. And in the part of that um, quite contentious negotiation phase amongst member states, there was this issue, there was this notion that, that access to remedy really um, uh, needed further attention, either through that new intergovernmental process or the first resolution um, call for that there should be a, um, a process to look into how to, to resolve some of the challenges relating to access to remedy. And the delegations that were negotiating then, they, some of them had been involved in the preparation for the project. And they then said, well, actually, why don't we just mandate the Office of the High Commissioner to continue the work they have erected? We like the approach. We like the idea that it is um, consultative, multi-stakeholder, evidence-based. 
So while we started this project as an OHCHR initiative that we didn't have a mandate from the Human Rights Council, in 2014, we got that mandate. And that basically, and I'll get into that in a minute in some more detail, but so that was the, the time frame, and we hadn't um, planned on that, but that certainly um, strengthened our, our um, determination to continue this work and also provided a certain impetus um, from having that recognition from the, from the council. We then spent the remainder of 2014 uh, working with stakeholders and, and um, analyzing the, the submissions we had received on the study. So we could then in January 2015, we were ready to launch the six. Um, yeah, sorry, that's uh, Lena seems to have uh, disappeared. Um, hopefully she will come back on. Um, but in the meantime, I am I'm happy to try to pick up um, where she uh, left off. So I, uh, I lost track a little bit of, of where she, um, uh, exactly where she cut out. But I think she was talking about the, the launch of the program of work and the, as Lena may, uh, may have gotten to, um, in, in January uh, 2015, sort of formally uh, started up the program of work on the six work streams and um, as Lena did, did cover it in um, on the basis of the initial study and in consultation with um, the work streams are designed they were selected among the, the issues identified in the study based on the potential um, for these issues to contribute to real change in the in the short to medium term and the areas where we felt that they will um, to generate really practical uh, implementable recommendations and so um, part of this um, projects uh, cover issues that the, the initial study identified as needing further clarification um, and discussion to to reach agreement of them um, six projects came out of uh, one of the main findings of the study that the work of domestic prosecution bodies um, has been it is is very um, um, th there's very little activity by domestic prosecution bodies um, and we don't know exactly why this is so we know that there are, are cases that are referred to prosecution bodies that don't result in in prosecutions um, but we don't know exactly what is preventing successful prosecutions of companies so um, and, and that project that we'll get back to because we're we are very pleased that we're actually collaborating with you guys at ICAR um, on the information recap. But in in January we formally started up this program of work, and um, in the time between January and, and August uh, this year, we are primarily in a in a data gathering um, and an input gathering phase. So. In May, the, on the 1st of May, we launched a global online consultation that is designed to gather inputs um, about five out of the six projects under the program of work. Um, the, this global online consultation is um, designed to allow all stakeholders to provide inputs to the process. We're asking them um, questions designed to identify how legal systems in different countries um, in cases where companies are alleged to be involved in severe human rights abuses. So we're asking um, questions or, um, under, under what conditions companies are held legally liable, the tests for, for corporate criminal um, and quasi-criminal and civil law liability. And we're asking questions about what are available funding options for legal claims. So what avenues are available to victims um, for, for funding and, and covering the cost of legal claims and, and what avenues are available to their representatives for covering their own costs. And then we're asking questions about what are available sanctions and remedies under criminal and civil law um, and are these effective in practice. I, I, do these result in, in real remedy for, for victims? Do they serve as deterrents? Um, and also participants' recommendations on, on how to improve that. Um, and then the final part, uh, we're asking participants for um, information about cases that they are aware of that have been referred to domestic prosecution bodies and where. Then this process is, is available in um, English, French, and Spanish, um, and we're giving we're asking people quite detailed questions, so we're giving them until this year. Um, in 
Parallel with, with that, we have also a, a more detailed comparative process um, that is designed to generate more, more granular and comparative information um, about the, the six um, work streams. And for that, that process actually itself uh, is a two-track two, two research process where we're on the one hand working with law firms and other legal experts to do quite detailed legal research um, on what the law says. And then the second track, uh, civil uh, public interest lawyers um, and pla other plaintiff lawyers and, and also some NGOs that are, are actually representing victims and helping to bring cases to get their perspectives on what actually happens in practice. So the information from those two processes will be triangulated and then also triangulated with the data that we get from the open survey process. Um, and the, the purpose of, of all of this information gathering is really to ensure that we have a very solid good space. Um, in some countries, we, we already have some of this information available, for example, in, in the US and, and the UK. Um, we probably do already have a lot of this information, but in, in many countries, we actually know very little about how the legal system performs in practice. When in, um, so it's, we have um, about 25 focus jurisdictions that are selected from the, the five regional groups in the UN to ensure a, a balanced regional representation. And then for, for the open process survey, we're hoping to be able to use that to, to fill in with information from um, a much broader range of legal systems. It may not be as detailed, um, but it will help us complement the information. From the that process is, is um, still, of course, in, in progress, and we're hoping to generate a lot more um, global information, but we're very pleased that we've already gotten some responses from countries that we haven't really had much engagement with uh, previously. Some of our first responses were from countries like Cuba and, and um, Burkina Faso, where we certainly didn't have much information available um, already. So we're, we're very much hoping that this open process survey will help us globalize um, the accountability and remedy um, project. We're, um, we're conscious that, that being the UN um, as well, it's, it's very important for us that we're not proceeding just with information from primarily Western countries where, where maybe it's easiest to get information, um, but that we're really making a, a conscious effort to reach out to, to all parts of the world. And so um, we're, we're trying to spread this, this uh, global process survey as far as we can, um, and we'll be doing that and really focusing on getting global information between this. Um, obviously that uh, now we're, we're still in Q2, um, and our focus right now is, is in the information gathering um, part of, of this project. So we're working, as I said, to spread the open survey as, as far and wide as we can to get a really broad evidence base. And at the same time, working to make sure that we have all of our 25 focus jurisdictions covered under the detailed comparative process. So we've been reaching out to um, law firms that are doing uh, some work for us pro bono for these um, jurisdictions and also have gotten a lot of, of great support from public interest lawyers and other victims representatives. So in the phase between now and, and the end of August, that is going to be our main focus. And then um, as we're, we're moving into the fall, we will start the um, analytical phase of the project where we will triangulate the, the data from the open survey and the detailed comparative process, um, work with academic experts to review the information that we get from different countries, and then start moving into a phase where we're taking that data and breaking it down by the six projects um, and looking at and doing the sort of project-specific analysis. Um, for each of the projects, we have a, a quite informal reference group of academics who have experience with and an interest in a particular part of, of the process. Um, and it's not only academics, but also um, lawyers, uh, NGOs, and, and other experts who have expressed an, an interest in taking part in this. And we'll use those experts to test the, the analysis that we're coming out with, test ideas um, for them to help us generate ideas and solutions and findings. And then um, that will be going on uh, between now and December really, but we're hoping to already at the forum in uh, November in Geneva to be able to present some of the, of the draft guidance for an initial round of, of um, uh, discussion and, and consultation with a broad audience 
and also in conjunction with that to host some expert uh, in-person meetings where we're discussing. So um, that will take us to the end of the year and then the first quarter of 2016 we will be focusing on refining the guidance, putting it out for public consultations. Um, most of that will be online um, but we'll focus then on, on make, making sure that we really publish it globally and that's input from um, all over the world and that that's a lot of stakeholders have opportunities to comment on it, recommendations. Um, we'll, we're exploring different um, online discussion forums and ways that we can try and, and make it interactive um, even as our, our resources will mean that it's going to be mostly uh, virtual consultations. Um, and then the, the end point for this phase of the, of the process is in June 2016 when we're presenting a report to the Human Rights Council for their consideration. Uh, what we're hoping to get um, at that point is that the Human Rights Council will endorse the recommendations and the findings that we're coming out with. Um, and then depending on where we are um, what, and depending on where we find, we may go and ask them for a specific mandate to do more detailed research or, or work on one part. Um, or we may um, ask for a different mandate to look at another aspect uh, of access to remedy. That will be decided by where the, the evidence leads us, essentially. But um, we're seeing this absolute, the, the be all and end all, um, the recommendations that we come out with may just be the start of another phase of the, of the project. So uh, that was the overall all time. We did were asked by the Human Rights Council um, and, and did just present a report to them that is a progress report. Um, it will be discussed at the June um, session of the Human Rights Council, starting on the 11th of June. Um, and that progress report, presenting some of the, in, the, the findings from the initial research that we've been doing in preparation for the global consultation process and other preliminary studies that, that we have undertaken um, to help us focus focus the, the work under the different work streams. Um, the main part of this progress report um, covers some preliminary work that we've been doing in relation to the roles and responsibilities of interested states. So that part of the project, uh, the, the cross-border cases and, and how home and host states um, are currently responding and, and should respond. Um, we did two preliminary studies uh, for that project. And one of them is, is just a very simple overview of state practices um, under two ILO um, conventions, the Forced Labor Convention and the Convention on the Worst Forms of Child Labor and their associated protocols. And so for that study, we looked at what data and, and information states are submitting um, or have submitted to the ILO on how they implement um, these protocols with a particular focus on any information that they submit uh, relating to cooperation between other states, between states. Um, that study found that, that currently there is, is um, at least a lack of information um, about management of, of cross-border cases and exercising of, um, of extraterritorial jurisdiction. There's, there's very little that states are currently um, submitting to the ILO in terms of of how such cases are, are managed. There are a few examples of uh, cooperation agreements, um, but otherwise quite a, quite a, um, an absence of, of information on that, which for us is perhaps not an ideal finding, but it's also a helpful finding um, that despite these, um, these conventions and, and their protocols to an extent contemplating extraterritorial jurisdiction, there's m not much that states are, are submitting that's, that's concrete on, on how this, this is being implemented. The second study um, that we undertook was a review of um, amicus curia briefs submitted by uh, sovereign states, so the US, but also um, foreign states, in alien tort statute cases involving uh, corporation acts. And the reason why we uh, um, chose to, to do this kind of study was that we really wanted to get examples of what arguments that states are currently making for or against um, extraterritorial jurisdiction. And the alien tort statute for, um, for all its, its issues being one forum where these cases have been brought, we thought that this would be, it would be helpful to look at um, under what condition states may be prepared currently 
to accept um, extraterritorial jurisdiction um, and what specific arguments they're making for or against. So we looked at, I think, some um, oh, there are 30 um, amicus briefs that have been submitted, um, most of them from Western governments, um, but also um, some involving non-Western countries. Um, and, and again, perhaps not, not surprisingly, but um, the key finding was that generally um, there are the states are, are um, making arguments ag against uh, the application of, of the alien tort statutes. Um, but there is a spectrum um, where the, the resistance is most strong in this sort of the findings from, from that study and from the ILO study. Um, from our perspective, will be used to refine our approach um, to Project 2. When we're looking at um, roles and responsibilities of interested states, we're looking to speak directly with states and, and work with them and, um, in, a, in an offline or, or sort of confidential format um, initially to, to try to understand when it might be possible um, to, for them to accept extraterritorial jurisdictions and, and under, under what conditions. Um, so this, the findings from, from these studies, it, it's more or less what we expected, I, I think, um, and we'll be using that to just refine our approach um, to working with states um, and making sure that we come from a, from a kind of realistic um, perspective. The, the last part of, of the progress report um, was a review of, of the research that we've been doing on, on funding of legal claims and just a, a brief sort of recap of, of issues emerging from literature, um, from a review of literature. We um, have been working um, sort of informally with some researchers at Oxford University who have done a very detailed um, comparative study of about 25 uh, or 30 uh, jurisdictions in terms of how civil litigation is, is currently funded um, in these countries. And some of the, the main findings from that um, include that the legal aid um, is generally being cut, uh, not, not expanded. Um, across the board, there are very few expanding legal aid. Um, court costs are, are generally high um, and in many countries on the increase. And there's a, a lack of, of articulated principles in most jurisdictions um, around the costs of, of bringing claims. So there are only a few jurisdictions that have really actually um, developed and, and, and pu made public their the principle um, approach to, to peace. Um, Again, that the, the finding from, from that research will just be used by us as, as we're doing the analysis um, relating to the project on, on funding and legal claims, making sure that we come from a realistic perspective and, and take into account the developments that are currently happening um, in different countries. So uh, that report uh, will be discussed in a, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, it is just a, a progress report, so there's not an, an outcome uh, from that in the Human Rights Council in June. It will just be submitted to them um, and they may um, acknowledge it, but we're not expecting a, a resolution or anything like that since this is a pro progress report. Um, I don't think there will actually be any resolution. But that is a, is a brief overview of where we are now and, and what's taken place up, um, up until this point. Um, just to end with a note on, on how people on this call may contribute, um, one way that would be deeply appreciated by us is for you to submit information through this open process survey. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's fundamental to us that we get information from a broad range of jurisdictions. Um, but we also want to get as, as much information as, as possible, um, even from jurisdictions like the US and, and the UK, where we more, may already have some information. Um, but the, the more data that we get from, um, from a diverse range of stakeholders, the, the sounder space will be. So the to the website is um, included here if you uh, it's to the portal on the business and human rights resource center um they have information about the project in, in english french and spanish um and also the links there to the global online survey and to a pdf version of the survey for people who may want to submit information via email instead um and the second way is to um submit information if there's, there are relevant articles, um, studies, or cases that you're aware of and that don't fit into the survey format, we would still love to hear about it. 
Um, so I think on the last slide, uh, there's an email address um, and information can be submitted just via email. And we'll certainly take all of that into account. Um, and thirdly, um, people that you are aware of uh, who may have an interest in, in being involved more as, a, as part of these informal um, reference groups of experts that I mentioned, then, then please get in touch with us. Uh, we definitely would like to, to hear from people with experience from different um, jurisdictions. Um, people may either have quite a detailed knowledge of one jurisdiction and may be interested in reviewing information uh, from one jurisdiction, the information from the open process and the, and the detailed process, or may have a particular interest in one project and would like to be a part of the reference group for that project. Um, the, the reference groups, as I said, are, are quite informal. It's not a huge but it would involve looking at and, and helping us validate and critique the findings and, and outputs that we're coming up with, um, and also to, to help generate recommendations. Um, there are people on the call, or if, you, if, uh, if you think of someone who might be interested in this, then certainly send them our way and, and we'd love to explore whether we'll be able to get involved. I think that was wanted to cover in the initial introduction. Um, so I don't know if people may have questions uh, or if, if there's anything. Uh, Lena will be active again. Uh, this is Katie. Thank you so much for that um, jumping in. <laughs> while we're experiencing technical difficulties. Um, Lena, if you want to try to unmute and take questions, um, that would be great. Otherwise, hopefully, we hope you're able to answer some questions. It's clear from your presentation that you will be working on this project quite in depth and are aware of um, you know, all the different elements of it. So are you looking for people to answer you know, just targeted information or um, the survey is quite in depth. Is it possible to to take bits and pen information, or are you looking for comprehensive um, answers to the the problems that you put out there? Yes, thanks for that, Katie. Uh, you cut out a little bit in the beginning, but I, I think I got the gist of it. Um, so, just to um, provide a little bit more information about the survey, yes, it's designed so that people can answer as much or as little as they want. It's divided into different sections that cover um, five out of the six projects in the, in the work stream, as I briefly mentioned. Okay, great. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we for, for people who want to respond via email, they can also just take parts of the, we have a PDF version, um, mm -hmm. and they can just simply respond to the questions that they want for that. So certainly, um, we know that not, not all of the information may be relevant for all stakeholders. Um, and so there's also some skip logic in the, in the survey so that if something doesn't apply to a particular jurisdiction, the survey will just skip over it. Has there been any surprising information that has come out um, from that consultation mm -hmm. that you would share? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> no, I, I don't think there's been anything very surprising. Um, in terms of the, the outputs that we're able to share at this point, um, that's mostly covered in the in the progress report that we submitted and the and these preliminary studies um, that are are now up on our website. Um, I guess it's so far the information that we've seen submitted through the open process um, has not been particularly surprising. It's it's sort of generally in terms of um, um, how companies are currently able to, to be held liable and, and we don't yet have sort of sufficient data that we've, um, we've started comparing it um, between jurisdictions. I guess um, from our perspective, in terms of the, the outputs from the preliminary studies for, for project two, um, it, it may be slightly surprising how little um, states have, have submitted in, in terms of information um, to the ILO about cooperating um, in these kinds of a really worst of, of the worst um, type of, of cases involving forced labor um, or the worst form of child labor, that there's still um, really an, an absence of, of concrete information um, about how states are, are cooperating um to handle these cases uh, there were there were really just a few examples that we found and and i just said and we this was a, a fairly brief review of the information that states themselves submit so 
that may not be completely comprehensive and, and we didn't look at all jurisdictions. We looked at, at the 25 focus jurisdictions. Um, but given the, the length of time that these conventions have been in force um, and the, the severity of those types of abuses, we would perhaps have expected to see a little bit more concrete information submitted through that. Um, but we're, we're certainly not taking that um, lack of information as a, as a confirmation that nothing is happening. Please fill out the survey, circulate it um, to other people who may have information that would be useful to the process. And best of luck to OHCHR in this very important endeavor. Thank, Thank you. you.